want to give you a little insight on how O plus A um, develops a project. And we're going to go over a case study project, which is this new Slack headquarters, which we finished last year. So um, O plus A is a, a unique in that we really only specifically focus on workplace and interiors. Uh, we do it for many companies, not just tech companies. Uh, we do sports apparel companies. We do we did the McDonald's headquarters with IA. Uh, we're working on the Adidas new headquarters. So we, we do a lot of industries outside of um, tech, but we have a really, really strong understanding of workplace. So what I want to first go over with you is the Slack project. And Laura, I don't know if you have to hit anything for me to share screen. Let's see. Yes, if you look at the bottom, yep. well, um, you have an iPad. There should be a screen, like my camera and then screen yep. icon. Yep. If you hit that, you should be able to share your screen. Do you need to send it to me so I can open it? Because right now it has a cross in front of it. So it says present content. Can you see, maybe you can see my screen already. Can we see my screen now? I can see your camera. Okay. If you, how do I share? It says present content and it's switched on. Um, it says you're the presenter. Okay. So if I, it's, it's not giving me the countdown to share screen. How do I do that? <laughs> Let's see. All right, I took it back. Do you see anything that looks like these four buttons at the bottom that say mic, camera, screen, leave? It, um, the screen, um, the little screen icon is no longer there. Um, okay. Before you, you know, when you switched over to hand it to me, it gave me the option to present from the iPad. So maybe you can hand it back to me again or. Okay. All right, let me. I'll make you presenter. Okay. Got it. Okay. Here we go. Perfect. Now, now it, that's going. All right. So as I mentioned, the first project, um, the project that we're going to go review today is a company called Slack and um, communication software. Many of you probably use it. Uh, this was a headquarters in downtown San Francisco. And what I want to talk about and illustrate mostly today, not only the design, but when O plus A jumps into a project, we usually really work hard to create a narrative and a story. Um, these things are very important in order for people to kind of feel um, a part of a company. So we don't just, for instance, if the logo and the colors are pink, green, and yellow, and we have a sign, we, we typically uh, our idea of telling the story of the brand is not just using the corporate colors and a sign. We actually want to learn about the kind of history of the company. We want to learn about what the company's cultural touchstones and philosophies are, because we can make a better design and story and narrative if we have those things as opposed to just a logo. So we really work hard to understand who the company is. So with this, we kind of learned a lot about the founder. Um, and he was, interestingly enough, born in Canada, raised in a commune, sort of very kind of hippie, uh, granola kind of culture, and he was into um, hiking. He learned a lot of his stuff from outdoors. So it was important for him to, under, to convey to his employees um, this sort of trail uh, etiquette, how to treat people. And he really wanted to um, create a a culture that people uh, were going to explore, 
going to treat each other nicely and and sort of bring people along. Um, so it was almost like this company, the metaphor was like, it's like a journey and the trail path is like, you know, on a trail path, you help people along. Uh, you don't necessarily just shy away, you give them directions. So that trail etiquette really became a big part of the story. Um, when we look at the priorities for the space, it becomes about culture, health, and function. Uh, these are the uh, character, the, the design attributes of circulation, lighting, plants, acoustics, authenticity to finishes, food service, storytelling through graphics, and choice. The building is 350,000 square feet, an existing building. This uh, different color differentiation shows us the phases. The project was approached in three phases. There was an existing tenant, so we wanted to make sure that we could fit them in, and we had to pick you know, the smartest way to, to bring each phase in. As I was mentioning before, the concept really became uh, sort of a, a story about trails and trail etiquette. And what we used to ground this story, since we had 14 floors to um, have the company in, is we used the Pacific Crest Trail. And if you're not familiar with it, the Pacific Crest Trail starts from Southern California and goes all the way up north uh, to Canada. And uh, so it starts from the desert all the way up to the glaciers and peaks that you might find up in um, in, in Canada, um, most 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 directly like Vancouver. So here's some things that we use to sort of like help us get, you know, imagery and inspiration of what that might be to be on a trail. So you, you'd see things like trail markers. You'd see uh, you'd have different terrains that you needed to pass. There might be a waterfall. There may be, in in this case, since with the desert, a deserty basin. Uh, maybe a ladder or some pathways and things like that. So this is uh, the Pacific Crest Trail on the left, and then these are some attributes of that trail. And the next thing we begin talking about is what the what the finishes need to be. And in this particular case, we're kind of dealing with nature. We're a little bit of hardscape, so a lot of it was based on natural materials. Um, things that could mimic um, the, the midnight sky, vegetation that might be uh, the undergrowth in a forest, um, and then woods and stones and gravel, leather straps that might be on a backpack, things of that sort. So we're trying to create the tactile portion of it that um, we all kind of do in design, but we want to make sure it reads very much in this idea of trail. The next thing we do is we start thinking about each floor as a posture and what is it like going through the various typographies, whether it's the desert plains or the rocky desert or the high desert mountains and lakes. Each one of those pre present a different type of posture, whether it's sitting, sitting below a shelter on the side of a hill. Uh, so we began breaking those down as sort of guides in which way we could sort of talk about those floors. as streams, forests, volcano craters, glaciers, summits. All these would be on the trail. Um, so the first floor we're going to look at is the desert plain. And the desert plain is a very kind of tan uh, colored um, desert scrub brush um, in terms of materiality and color. So you're kind of seeing a little bit of that there. Here's an area of entry. This is the main lobby. Um, so what do you have at the main lobby if you're doing a major ascent of a mountain or a big trail, we actually created base camp. So we've got these tent-like structures, trees, elements that you might find at base camp. So we sort of created architecture and design that looked like little tents, sling chairs, um, little materiality, little planting. Uh, but if you kind of look at it and squint, it could, could very well be like an abstracted base camp. The next level is the second floor in the rocky desert. So the, you're seeing the tonality change in terms of color material, bigger floor plate. Uh, we do a lot of studies of what the floor needs to count, head count needs to be and how many, how many conference rooms and spaces do we need to 
to maintain a, a healthy open plan. Uh, finished pallet and skiing to a little bit more warm, warmer neutrals, and still with a large kind of uh, kind of natural feel to it. This is um, their their help desk area. This is kind of where they would go take computers, get updates on their devices. And this is the waiting area. Kind of feels like um, a gray sky with some nice warm tones. Um, area to sit here is actually. Got Sarah got got, um, got lighting got a lighting system that creates um, sorry, lighting to the circadian rhythm, so you could be deep in the in a building and this lighting system will change colors as the sun kind of moves across the sky in the same kind of color range. Here you're seeing a conference room or whiteboarding area, and you're seeing again materials that are raw breeze block things that you might find in desert architecture, um, scruffy landscape things of that sort. So we're really playing up that feel. And then under the desert sky, so you're seeing an abstracted Milky Way with Milky Way sort of printed on the walls. So you're you're in a building, but we're trying to convey this idea of outdoor. The next floor is called the high desert. Um, seeing the open plan, our studies, the finished palette is again, starting to get warm, warmer, warmer, maybe a little greener. Uh, what is what do you find on the high desert? You know, you might find observatories, uh, foggy trails, ropes, things that you might be climbing inclines. Um, here's the, the detailed drawings of what that space looked like. Um, again, we're just trying to recreate that feel on that level of what you might what you might come across. The fourth floor, uh, we have the mountains. Um, it's starting to get a little grayer. We're starting to change elevation. So you're seeing the color change. And this is also a way to indicate what floor you're on. So without signage, we're sort of like the ascent is also telling you what floor you're on. Um, and then you're seeing that play out with different vegetation, different flooring colors. So the palette just starts to change as we begin ascending. And you see craggle rocks, details that maybe a cave, um, and, and sort of architecture that is mimicking it. And then the kitchens. You're gonna see several kitchens and they all are very different and they're all in different parts of the building because we know that people, if there's something, if it's been curated and it feels like it's been thought about, people use those spaces. So we try hard not to make a clone stamp of a kitchen 20 times over. We try to make them all feel special. The mountain lakes, so we're starting to move up. Maybe you come across this coloration. Materia Capal is getting more blue, more watery. Um, structures you might find on that area. So this like could be a, a, a shed, a, a bridge uh, with a truss system. So we're, we're speaking about the trail, but we've abstracted it. There's a quiet working area. See a little bit of a open all hands eating area. This trellis, actually all these ferns now grew across the top. So it's very much almost a biophilic thing now. So the, again, this was early on in the project and we had plants So this takes time. Some of this stuff grows in over time. Coffee areas, sixth floor, more waterfalls and streams. Um, conference, here's some of the coloration. Um, <clears throat> ceiling system with uh, light shine through it, sort of this dappled light, like if you were underwater and, and a stream, that might be what the light looks like. Uh, cascading waterfall areas with blue, blue seating cushions. We actually have more of a blue film on those glass. So it really reads like a water element. And then another kitchen, different finish. Um, the idea that you're going to have under the midnight sky cave like feeling adjacent to workstations. Um, and then we're on the floor seven and maybe you're at the Redwood forest in Northern California. So we're getting tones from that. Interesting. We do actually have ferns and we had um, a lot of uh, wall space to create this greenery and richness that you might find in the understory of a forest. Um, actual tree limbs, um, a canopy of 
of trees might have this, again, almost like the stream, but a very different kind of dappled light with different shapes and different ferns and materiality changes. Tree trunks, um, big, big tree trunks. In the Pacific Northwest, you can have them as big as a car for some of these um, historic redwoods. So we're, we're, we're playing with straps that you might see in a backpack or a tent and sort of mimicking. So these are very abstracted ideas, but they do kind of look like trees to me. Volcanoes, um, these might be something, craters that you're gonna see, coloration changes again, uh, a little gray, a little cooler. Also some really nice dark rich browns, vegetation, maybe volcanic fissures with light pushing through them, outdoor um, gardens with paths, with uh, very, very drought tolerant succulents. Uh, we're sort of getting close to the top now uh, with the glacier. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of blues, a lot of grays, uh, this sort of fractured uh, fissure floor plan. We actually have like um, stones, um, sky that could be the northern lights. So we use this diachroic film. Um, each floor at the elevator has a different finish. So you kind of know you're on the desert floor, you know you're on the glacier floor. They, the lighting system e even changes and cools a bit. Uh, you might see the northern lights. So we kind of created this aurora borealis feel as you walk through the space in one of the corridors. Uh, off angle, very kind of rock formation, polygon shape um, rooms and details. Little openings in the wall that could be like a little porch that kind of formed in a rock formation. And then we're at the top at the summit and it gets very gray, very blue. Uh, not too different from the palette below, but this is a reception. You're seeing like the edge of a stone. It's a reception station. It's actually lightweight concrete, but made to look like a stone piece kind of carved out. Uh, actually, we had stone reliefs in the walls that were backlit to, again, reiterate we're at the top, the blue, the coolness of being at the, at the glacier top. Uh, we had a little sort of crow's nest mezzanine that you can climb up and you can kind of see the rock formation sort of like moving. Um, almost like a, a little um, arcade of, of, of mountain types um, as railing. And then these were, were really kind of tent structures that we were kind of creating. So like maybe you're setting up another camp at the top and on the edge of this glacier or something like that. Um, actual pictures of, of like Mount Everest in sort of a big exploded way. Um, Obviously, you're working here, but you're just kind of the things and colors can cool down to create that sense. So that that's that's really a really high high level kind of quick pass through through the Slack project. Um, it's, it's it's kind of interesting. It won um, Inc. Magazine's uh, best office to work in last year. So uh, these spaces actually we spend a lot of time on the strategy and the function of the areas. But you can work anywhere. It's all open plan. You can pick your choice, work up in the top floor. There's no there's no sort of hierarchy that the executives are on the top floor. It's distributed. You kind of work anywhere. So um, I'm going to jump to a quick video, which I think helps explain our concept uh, a little bit clearer. And, and it shows a little bit of our office. So you're going to get to see a little bit of the O plus A design office. Can you hear the volume? I cannot. No? Let me start it again. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, there we go. asking to explain the design, especially as it applies to interiors. We're trying to create experiences, memorable experiences. How do we want to work with our colleagues? How do we want to work with our fellow designers or, or programmers or developers? Well, we 
want to bring them along. The trail is all about discovery. The way that you go through the trail is that you are willing to kind of put yourself out there and make a choice between going left or right. No map is going to ever get you through this. <laughs> You're going to have to go and discover it yourself. We're on a journey. The trail becomes a very real design tool for us. From desert to the high plains and underneath the canopy, we can have this movement through the space. If you meet somebody along the way, hopefully you kind of take them along. I think design helps people do the things they need to do. So whether it's focus, whether it's rest, whether it's socializing with your friends, you know, I think it helps create the perfect moment for something to happen. Okay, so that's kind of what I had, Laura. I don't know if you have any questions or if anybody wanted to, to kind of, you know, pick my brain on, <laughs> on the Slack project or what it's like to do design. Um, but that that's kind of, uh, wow, I almost ended short of 30 minutes. Sorry about that. I ran fast. Oh, that's totally fine. I'm sure some questions will trickle in. I personally had one as I was um, looking at your presentation. How do you handle um, the vegetation? I mean, because I, I'm an interior designer and I've I've wanted to use more of it. So I didn't know if you had a specialist you brought in or a maintenance contract and how to slack. I mean, you know, just slack kill them all after you go, <laughs> after you leave. <laughs> So how do you handle that aspect? Because I know that's a big thing, the biophilic design aspect right now. So I'd love to hear more about that personally. So it, it really depends. Um, some of those some of those are just potted plants that get on a watering routine or there's some drip irrigation system. The more sophisticated ones will have an entire irrigation. If it's a wet wall or a sort of a living wall, then we, you know, those are kind of expensive. The, the what's behind the scenes is you don't see like a hundred thousand dollars worth of watering sort of like a sort of a whole watering system that fits into the wall you put that in first and then you put the plants in second uh, living walls tend to be expensive um, because there's a lot of dense vegetation or you can simply you know have potted plants and put drip irrigation in it you just got to make sure that they don't start dripping and kind of messing up your floor so there are companies that specialize in indoor plants. Uh, so we use a combination of those companies and then living wall systems. And there's so many out there now. So you can really bring a lot of planting into space these days. Good question, though. Well, that's that's good to know. I mean, that's that's something I, I can see trying to do and it looks great for the first week and then <laughs> if it's anything like my house the second week they're all dead so yeah. um i was just curious and then feel free if you're if you're a student or somebody and you want to turn off your mic or or turn on your mic and ask a question or put it in the chat um feel free to speak up if you have anything i thought that was a really interesting case study yeah it's very contemporary office open plan um we specialize in, in in open plan or agile work, so we have a really strong understanding of how of how those spaces go together. You saw those tables on the side. We really focus on the right amount of rooms, telephone booths, shelters, conference rooms. All those things become really important in the success of these designs. So we want to make sure that we have enough rooms for people to go to. So. Um, I don't, I can't seem to read the chat line. <laughs> I okay. saw a question pop up, but then I couldn't, I couldn't read. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. So I found something. Okay. So, 
I got it. So let's see. How do you handle vegetation? Oh, just answered that question. Uh, that was good. <laughs> um, Megan Hill, how long did that whole project take from start to finish? Two, two years. It uh, was several phases. Uh, the tenant was Jimbery, and they didn't move out of the building all at once. So we took the floors as they moved out. So the three phases took about two years. And there's a significant amount of remodel. So a lot of the stuff that was in the um, floors for the previous client we removed. Um, how do you sell a client on spending on the living wall from Cassandra? Well, a lot of, um, for that very question, you said about the long-term maintenance and actually what it kind of does to keep a company sort of biophilic and we know vegetation is important. So a lot of companies will will spend on a big move like that because it does kind of help with the overall attitude and biophilic design we know is very important, healthy, healthy work environments. Um, what advice can I give to new graduates? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that you are probably coming into a time where everybody's rethinking their workplace. So in, in a way, there's going to be a lot of, of work because it's changed. You know, we've got people working from home. We have a new kind of a new model of what we're seeing um, for companies. And that all needs to be thought about and designed. And it's interior designs that designers that do that so i would say learn learn a lot about you know biophilic sustainability uh, to the degree you can understand how to do space planning and develop interior workplace layouts it's probably the i'm not sure how the schools teach it in 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 your area uh, sometimes that's not very well kind of taught because it's usually the furniture dealerships that do that um, so I would say get to learn that because you can see how much space planning goes into these spaces. There's a there's a big function of the space. Um, what is the biggest advice? So yeah, get to learn how to you know furniture product things of that sort. Look and start practicing laying those out. Um, so yeah, are our plans more open plan? Um, are we adjusting for COVID? There, there's still so the the model for the future is going to be maybe this more distributed work, and when we do come to the office, there'll be a desk there, but it may not be our desk the whole day. It may not be our desk for the week. Um, we may be going there um, when we need specific type of tasks, and then there will be a, a well offices that we go there, and we will have a permanent location. It really depends on the type of company. Um, the whole COVID thing. Yes, there's going to be, you know, more more behavioral changes than anything else about washing your hands, not coming to work sick, uh, disinfecting type lights and maintenance and strategies will be employed uh, to make the office space safer and healthier. Um, again, that's kind of what I mentioned. You will be responsible for all these new spaces. They all have to be rethought about and redesigned. Um, I think, okay. Well, I think the importance is kind of growing um, with the neurodiversity, biophilic design, people, whether you're working from home or you're working at a WeWork or some shared workplace, all these all these new spaces in in light of what COVID is need to be re-examined and redesigned to to make them safer so kind of the future right now is there's going to be a lot put on the interior designs you know kind of plate in order to 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 solve it because no one's at the workplace right now because they don't feel safe so these workplaces need to be reimagined and redesigned to make people feel safe again I think, I think that was the last question, Laura. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if we have any others or anything else had, anyone else had anything that they wanted to chime in and say or, or not. Um, you take a look at our website. Um, we do offer summer internships. 
Um, we are getting quite busy, so we are starting to take those in for this, you know, if you were in the spring semester and looking for something for summer or fall, we have interns all year round. Um, so, you know, what you're seeing in evidence-based design, um, a lot of those tools that you see to the side, um, that's a little bit about just that subject, is that over time, O plus A has now been doing workplace for 30 years. We've developed um, approaches for agile work. We've developed whole strategies on groups and, and how they function in a space, and we have our sort of highest and best practices. And those ratios are sort of things that we know we've created a whole document on what an open plan needs. So for instance, if you have an open plan and you have, let's say 20 people or 30 people and you have three conference rooms, a large, a small, and a medium, well, that's probably not gonna work because those 20 people at any given time need to have a conference room, a telephone room, uh, area in which to do collaborative work. So all those spaces um, need to be accounted for. So we actually look at every one of those spaces and give them a place and a ratio. So we like to say most offices in the day used to be like for every 20 people, there'd be a conference room. Um, we've now got a ratio of one to four and it's not just a conference room, it could be an ancillary space, like a lounge, it could be a telephone booth, it could be a communal space. But the idea is that all the office is, everything is the office, everything is a place we can work. We can now work with any device, iPads, your phone, not necessarily a computer. So any opportunity that you're sitting down and you're able to kind of move work around or respond to something is work. Um, and we know what those ratios are. So we we apply a lot of that um, to O plus A's designs so that we have a functioning workplace. Is that something that you have available or is that just for your office use? If anybody Before, wanted to look up that information? Yeah, you can actually. So I've lectured on workplace typologies and we do have a book that's going to come out. We have actually just published some things on workplace of the future. Um, there was an article recently in the New Yorker and Metropolis on that. We actually have a toolkit for COVID that you can go online at O plus A and download that and see what approaches you need to make to a building or an office in order to make sure it's safe. And the workspace strategy stuff, um, we do have a book out there, The 12 True Tales of Workplace, which talks about that. I've done a number of lectures on it, so you can kind of learn about our strategy from that. But we are going to be publishing a new book called Workplace Typologies 2. So there you kind of learn all of the logic and, and methods we use to create behavioral changes, very, very you know, productive experiences that you need to have in the workplace to make them successful. Do you typically pursue like certification under like a green building system like LEED or WELL or yeah, I mean, how do you see that? Most, mostly in California, you know, you have to do things to a minimum of gold. So that's sort of like the lowest, lowest standard right now. And we do platinum. We do a lot of things above that. But you have to build to that even if you're not going to get certified in California. Um, we work elsewhere and we always kind of stress that those are important milestones to hit as well as employing well. Um, a lot of different things are going to come into play for designers. Neurodiversity, biophilic design, um, sustainability, ecology, inclusion. Now we have a whole thought on, um, on that. So that's going to be actually coming out in another piece that we're going to produce about, you know, 
uh, workplace workplace strategies to create um, inclusion and not just from a universal design perspective but um, race um, gender everything do you have like I mean I'm sure you do but like do you like Instagram do you post all of that information on like social media sites so if students wanted to follow you guys they could see when this becomes available yeah we have a lot of followers a lot of student followers so we 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 announce kind of everything like you can get the toolkit go straight to our website our website has a lot of information um, about projects we've worked on um, nonprofits we've designed um, experimental projects o plus a is sort of a I would say it's more of a kind of we have a unique design process and we like to apply it to a lot of different fields. Um, people know us for office design, but we've done a lot of number of exhibits. We did a food for thought truck, which was a, a mobile design truck that went around California and provided uh, design thinking to disadvantaged uh, communities because we're fortunate enough to work with very kind of, I would say, you know, companies that can afford to have designers. And then there's a lot of people that don't have access to design thinking. So we think it's important to teach it to, to students, to communities of kind of the power of design. Um, and that's all on the website. So you should follow us there, Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn, because uh, you'll get a different, because each one of them has a different audience. A lot of people on Instagram. And then the last thing I have for you personally, I mean, you feel free if anybody else does to so throw it in the chat, but I think one of the, the big discussion topics for us is um, for student day to day is like reshaping interior design. And we've talked some of that about, um, you know, through um, your project right there and then COVID and various other things. But um, one of the biggest things that we're also discussing is the importance of design community um, and being, you know, um, particularly now since COVID is such an isolating force in our community, how do we, um, I guess, become more tight knit and what's the importance of design community? If you could speak to that really quickly, I think that would be a great note to end unless somebody has anything else. Well, I would, I would say that you, you know, whether I would, being a designer, you need to be extremely well-rounded. So, Yes, IIDA, ASID, AIA, AIGD, GA. I mean, you, you, as a designer, you actually are kind of control of many different things. <laughs> Wayfinding, signage, technology, furnishings, and you're, you're sort of the orchestrator in a lot of ways, especially if it's an existing building, you're doing all that. So you, you need to be well-rounded in all these different aspects that affect the space. So to me, it's like learn as much as you can in your first job, you may think you want to do the, be the designer. To be a well-rounded designer, you need to uh, you need to understand holistically a lot of things in order to bring the best designs forward. So I would say, join organizations, um, build your resource library of designs, learn about certain designers that you like, um, learn about architects that you like. And, and when I say designers, it could be graphics, it could be industrial designers. You know, look at their methodology, look at their process, because you need to develop your process. And your process is very kind of personal to you. Um, don't just go online and download a bunch of images from the net, go out and take pictures, go out and go to the library and kind of do some research, because you are, in a sense, a resource to the firm. And the more you know, the more you're equipped and well-rounded, the more useful you are to the firm. All right. Well, we will end on a happy note. Uh, Primo, if you would help us draw our raffle prize winner, if you would pick a number between 1 and 115. 115? No. Yeah, so we got quite a few. <laughs> 85. 85. Okay, let's see who. Lucky number 85. Okay, 
Sally Ann Misseldean from Auburn. Nice. So if you are on the call, congrats. If not, we'll reach out to you. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Laura. Laura. Yes. Uh -huh. with ASID. Um, we actually have two more prizes. They're going to give us four instead of just two. And the oh, prize, that. yeah, the prize is um, the NCIDQ, the first exam um, that you can take while your senior year in, high, uh, in college or your first year out of school. Um, they're going to let you have it for free. So I'm going to need Mr. Opila, if he doesn't mind, giving me two more numbers between the number of, uh, between one and 58. 23. <laughs> the 23, that would be, let me check and see. Emma Georgeoff, are you online? Yes, I am. Well, congratulations. You're going to Thank get one you. of them. I'll get with you later to uh, arrange for that. And one more number. Between the same amount? Yes, between 1 and 58. 45. 45. Let's see. That is going to be, uh, just give me one second, Neely Turner. Neely, are you online with us? Yes, I am. Congratulations, you're the other winner, so yay. Woo. Yay. <laughs> all right. Well, then that's all I have. Bryant, did you have anything else? I don't other than say how much I have enjoyed it and how much I've learned. And I can't thank you enough, Mr. Opila, for coming in and sharing everything with us. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for inviting me. And good luck yeah, I you. certainly agree. For, from both IIDA and ASID, we're, we're very grateful for you and everything you've done for the design community. You're very welcome. Happy to help. All right. Well, then, thanks and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.